Thank you for that very kind and recent introduction. Uh, one of the things that I always enjoy about coming to Monkey Gras, and this happens literally every year, is that I'll be at lunch, you know, I'll be at the uh, dinner afterwards, and people will come up to me and say, thank you, this is an amazing event, you did a great job. And I have to tell them that I had literally nothing to do with this. I show up, for the most part I show up, I attend, this year obviously I'm speaking, and you know, people think in many cases that I'm being sort of falsely modest. They're like, no, no, I'm sure you did something. I'm like, no, I legitimately did nothing. And I can prove it. Because the one thing that I would never do if I had any organiza organizational hand in this is schedule myself for the first talk <laughs> to lead off the conference after a night out in a pub. But here we are. So as James said, we're here to talk about uh, convenience. And we're going to talk about some ideas. We're going to go through some examples. Many of you in the room, how many of you are clients of ours? Because some of you, if, OK. You guys are screwed. You're going to have heard some of these talks before. But some of it will be new. Uh, one of the, the new slides was uh, this one. So I asked on Twitter, <coughs> this was I think last week, uh, if anybody knew why I was going to have this in my slides today. Anybody know the answer? Any last guesses? Here's a couple. So people were guessing. Uh, my, my personal favorite, by the way, was the old-fashioned. Um, <laughs> it actually was not an old-fashioned. So many of you who study history probably know this. Uh, those of you who are older may have some first-hand experience with it. I tend to doubt that. But the fact is, is that you know, for many years, uh, those blocks of ice were how we did refrigeration. So one of the companies uh, that did this was called the Southland Ice Company, and they sold ice. You know, so this is, it's difficult, obviously, to conceive of now, because we're used to refrigerators and freezers, and you, know, they, you can pick them up for 50 bucks in a, in a store for a little you know, thing for your office. But for many, many years, this is effectively how people cooled food. All right? And actually, where I come from in Maine, uh, the Kennebec River still kind of blows my mind. In the winter, they would carve out giant blocks of ice dump them on ships, pack the ships with ice and sawdust, and actually ship it off to India. So the fact that they could get ice and pack it simply with sawdust and make it to India with the ice not having melted is kind of amazing. But here in the States, obviously, they would cut up uh, smaller pieces of that. You would take this chunk of ice, and you would bring it back to what you called an ice box. It's one of the reasons that refrigerators are still referred to uh, as ice boxes by some people. So you had stores uh, operated. Uh, like the Southland Ice Company, and you would take these blocks of ice and uh, sell them. You know, this is effectively how people, again, did refrigeration, and this was a retail outlet that did this. So uh, there was a, in 1927, there was an employee of the Southland Ice Company, uh, Uncle Johnny, uh, that's how he's referred to, who decided that, you know what, um, what if we didn't just sell ice? You know, what if people came to us and were able to buy things other than ice? So he made the decision to sell a couple of other things, um, milk, bread, eggs, uh, basic staples. And one of the things he found is, is that uh, by being open seven days a week, you could also sell to people, particularly on Sundays, you know, when the grocery stores were typically closed. So he you know, essentially had this revelation. The co-founder of the South and Ice Company looked at the sales uh, for this particular location started to take off and said, huh, that's, that's actually pretty interesting. And they rolled it out uh, to all the rest of the stores. And you know, within uh, the span of a couple of years, all of the stores had graduated from, hey, we're effectively a, an ice sale. And they actually used to call them ice docks, uh, apparently. And this became what we now know as 7-Eleven. So this being the UK, is Anybody not familiar with this brand? It is global. So 7-Eleven essentially was the, the first, uh, or at least one of the first, depending on who you, you talk to, of what we now know today as convenience stores. And it came out of this simple idea, which was, all right, we have this product that we're selling. 
uh, this, this, these blocks of ice, and maybe people want something other than just this block of ice. <clears throat> maybe we can, you know, per the theme of the show, package up some other items and sell them. So as we said, we started with, uh, you know, essentially bread, milk, uh, eggs. Uh, they moved on in 1928. They added gas, because as it turns out, blocks of ice are pretty heavy. They tend to be picked up in automobiles, so why not allow customers to refuel those automobiles uh, while getting the gas? And actually, it turned out that uh, apparently it was pretty convenient because the setup for these ice docks was pretty large, I guess, shipping the ice in and out. So it was very easy for customers to come in, get their gas, and maneuver because the ice docks were 60 feet back or uh, thereabouts. Apparently, cars in 1928 were not super maneuverable. Um, so 7-Eleven, <clears throat> again, is this, this convenience store brand we all know. One of the things that we know about the brand is that it's open not till 11 o'clock at night, as it was for many years, uh, hence the 7-Eleven brand, but it's open 24 hours a day. So if you've ever you know, tried to get, uh, if you're ever in the South Market uh, District in uh, San Francisco, it's one of the only places if you get in off a flight at one at night that you can go in and get some terrible, terrible food. Um, because unlike New York, uh, for example, uh, everything closes at 10 or 11 o'clock at night for some reason. Anyhow, so the question obviously is, OK, this used to be open until 7 or 11 at night. Why is it now open 24 hours a day? Well, as it turns out, in 1963, uh, one of the locations right near this location, the University of Texas, uh, was open uh, following a University of Texas football game. They had a whole bunch of people who came in and would not leave, so the store ended up being open a lot later than 11 o'clock at night. They ended up selling a ton. They ended up selling enough that they looked at this and said, huh, maybe we should be open later. And they started uh, at that point in 1963, being open around the clock. So again, trying to make something more convenient for customers, trying to take uh, customers' needs in terms of maybe we need something other than just ice. Maybe we want to be open on Sundays. Maybe we want to be open 24 hours a day and trying to build and structure a business around this. So what does this have to do with technology? Well, obviously, you know, there's the, the sort of power of convenience, the whole theme of this particular talk. But how is this applied specifically to individual cases? Like how does this play out in the markets that we build, that we create, uh, and that we, you know, certainly as analysts, uh, take apart and look at. <clears throat> Many of you have probably heard this story from me before, uh, but in, it would have been probably 2005, 2006, I had conversations with the Postgres, a couple of the Postgres developers, and they asked me a question. They said, look, you know, qualitatively and objectively speaking, we feel like we have a better database, but we're getting killed, you know, from an adoption standpoint. Everybody's using MySQL. Why is that? And I said, okay, well, you know, how do you get Postgres? They said, oh, it's not a big deal, you know, particularly relative to something like Oracle. You know, you go to Postgres, uh, the, the website, you can download a build, we have builds for different distributions, no big deal. And I said, okay, how do you get MySQL? And they said, well, it's a little different, it's in a Linux repository, so it's just sudo apt-get install MySQL. I'm like, that's a big part of your problem. And that simple realization, I mean, that, literally that's something that we talk about with customers all the time. I, I must have had this conversation hundreds of times at this point. And yet, it's so obvious, but it's something that we all forget. It's something that, and you know, certainly not just uh, you in the room, certainly we at Redmond forget this ourselves. We forget to think about, you know, take that step back and think about not just what we're delivering it, but how is it packaged, how is it consumed, how is it accessible? And you see this today, you know, when you talk to uh, developers, everybody wants to focus on the product, everybody wants to focus on the performance, the reliability, the engineering, quality of the implementation. We love to geek out on product. And frankly, as analysts, we're as guilty of that as the next person. We love fancy implementations, you know, things that are faster, bigger, more reliable, and so on. But at the end of the day, that ends up in many, many cases being completely ancillary to questions of adoption. Adoption is a completely separate question. And we see this today. Did anybody see the, uh, the Rethink DB postmortem? Came out last week or two weeks ago? Okay, bunch of hands. For those of you who haven't seen it, I recommend you read it. 
I think it, it was very well done. It was very candid. Um, essentially, the, the, the gist of it is essentially it was a postmortem on the business. The Rethink DB, uh, uh, essentially business failed. And it was a discussion, an open, candid discussion by the founder in terms of why, and what happened. And one of the things that, you know, there were many sort of interesting pieces to the piece, which I you know, highly recommend, again, that you all take a look at and, take, and read. But one of the interesting takeaways for me is, is that there wasn't a lot of talk of convenience. There wasn't a lot of talk of, essentially, what are the fundamental underlying reasons that that business failed. And he talked, in part, about things like databases as a service. He talked, in part, about you know, sort of the cloud and how that's changing the databases. And we'll come back to this. But again, I think that the core lesson for RethinkDB for every, and not just database company, certainly as we'll go through, is you really need to think about uh, the convenience factor. So we've all experienced this, right? Uh, how many of you have actually been to one of these chain record stores like a Sam Goody? And so not that many hands. And one of the reasons for that is that Napster uh, effectively kicked off what we now know, you know, what we now have in terms of uh, Spotify and um, you know, certainly one of the, the first to really break the DRM uh, cycle was Apple uh, with iTunes. But effectively, this was a, a huge, uh, essentially, difference in convenience, right? So in other words, the product that you could buy from Sam Goody was better, really inarguably better. It came at a much higher quality. You know, if you wanted the whole record, you had it. It was, you know, complete, whereas, not that I ever used Napster, but I hear. <laughs> that you couldn't really get a full record, you get part of it, uh, you know, the bit rate, you know, sort of attached to some of the downloads would be insufficient, you know, some of the files would be incomplete or corrupt. So you had this worse product, but was much more convenient. So instead of getting in a car and physically going to a record store and having to buy an entire record, I could go on to, I, or somebody else, <laughs> could go on to Napster and download a single track. You know, again, not necessarily the same quality of product, but it gave me a much better experience, a much more convenient experience. And again, we see this sort of in, in lots of walks of life, right? So PHP for us is, uh, according to our rankings, is three. Number three on the list of all the languages we rank. It really hasn't moved since we've been doing the rankings. And of all the rankings, certainly at least the ones in the top 20, it has to be the most maligned. People hate PHP. I mean, legitimately hate it. And yet it runs, what? A third of the web, depending on how you figure these things, depending on you know sort of the relative size of uh, properties like a Facebook or WordPress.com, it's enormous. It's an enormous uh, community. It's an enormous set of languages. And why? If we compare it, you know, for example, to what you can do with the C programming language, what you can build, you can build things that are faster, better engineered uh, in C, but it turns out it's just less convenient. It takes longer. Requires a lot more training you know, to get up and running. With PHP, you can basically, unfortunately, you can have somebody up and running in a week or two and cranking out just horrible, horrible applications that look terrible and are not maintainable. But it's more convenient. All right? So when we look at open source, there are many, many sort of ways that convenience plays in. And arguably, and I've seen this argument made, that Windows actually, particularly in the early days, was more convenient than Linux because it was simply because it was further along in the, in the maturation cycle, right? It was a more refined product. They had user interfaces, you know, to set things up and to configure. Many of the things that Linux, in the early days, you had to do by hand. But Linux, like virtually every other open source product competing with a proprietary alternative, had the huge advantage in that it was more convenient to get, right? Because Windows, as convenient as a user interface might be, you know, particularly if I lack training, I have to pay for it, I have to go somewhere, I have to talk to somebody to get a license for it. I don't have to do that with Linux. I don't have to do that with any open source product, for the most part, because I can just go download it. And that, you know, everybody wants to talk about pricing advantages, everybody wants to talk about the malleability of the open source projects themselves in the sense that I can get in and make modifications and sort of bend a project to my particular needs. We don't talk as much about the convenience the availability, the accessibility that the open source model provides. And it, you know, sort of, it, it's manifesting itself in sort of interesting new ways. So some of you may have seen this. We, we did a look, uh, it was last week or two weeks ago, 
Uh, we take periodic looks at licensing trends. And I'm not going to get into the substance of the copyleft versus permissive licensing trends here, like the merits of the individual licenses. Uh, one, because I don't have time. Two, because I don't want any fistfights. Um, the point is, is that our research, really every time we've done this, uh, and certainly this is the most significant change that we've seen, has seen a shift towards permissive licenses. So what is a permissive license? Many of you in the room may know this, uh, do know this. But for those of you who don't, a permissive license is one that is basically what it sounds like. It's very permissive. It allows you effectively to do more or less whatever you want with a given code base. And obviously, the rights and responsibilities uh, differ language to language. But when we look at uh, the two that have made the biggest gains you know, over the last 10 years, or this period is uh, seven, are the Apache Software License and MIT. MIT has made the, the bigger gains. And why is that? What is driving that, right? There's many potential explanations. I actually just got tagged in a, uh, uh, there, a podcast this morning, I guess, is discussing this. Uh, there are a lot of potential explanations. When I look at this and when I talk to developers, you know, one of the things that you know, we take away, one of the things that I hear sort of over and over, is that permissive licenses are just more convenient. Because basically, once you tag something with a permissive license, it doesn't matter, right? You don't really have. You know, there are, there are, for example, the Apache license, you have some uh, patent things to think about. MIT, you don't really have many rights. You don't have many responsibilities, rather. If you want to take the, an MIT license asset, wrap it up, and you know, sort of release it as a proprietary product, great, go for it. You're absolutely able to do that. So again, without getting into whether this is a good or a bad thing, uh, the power of convenience is one thing. The merits of convenience, are, or the morals of convenience, I should say, are a completely separate conversation. But basically, when we see the trends playing out over time, they seem to be sort of manifesting in more and more um, essentially accretion around things that are more convenient. And so this is theoretically, I guess if you're a permissive license advocate, this is the good news. There's bad news. So this is a slide from GitHub. And GitHub did a, uh, an analysis in 2015 of their, all of their repositories. This is the percentage of repositories, total percentage of repositories at GitHub that are licensed. And it's not real good. So what's more convenient than a permissive license? Well, for many developers, it's not assigning a license at all, not making that choice. And the difficulty is, is that this obviously leaves us with you know, hundreds of thousands of repositories that have no license attached to them and therefore are open source in the sense that the source is open, but they're not open source because they do not have an open source license attached to them. So again, you know, convenience can you know, sort of both uh, give and take away. So software as a service, again, is a manifestation of this trend. Uh, did any of you ever do implementations for package CRM? Anybody? We got one hand in the back. All right, so you and me know this. It's a terrible, terrible process. Terrible process. So when I was a systems integrator in the 90s, we'd run around and we did these implementations. Um, and you basically have the same conversation with lots of different SIs, which is essentially, we'll implement this. You're going to pay us to implement this. And there's probably, there's, depending on whose numbers you believe, there's a one in two chance this fails. So great. You, know, you can go out and spend you know, seven figures on a piece of software, and you have a roughly a coin flip as to whether that has any value for you whatsoever or whether it's a total disaster that gets you fired. On the other hand, you have you know, an a alternative come in and say, all right, you know all that's, those things you don't necessarily like to do? Go out and do dog and pony shows with software. Uh, bring hardware in, set it up, maintain it, protect it, uh, find some place to house it, power, cooling, all those sorts of fun things. What if you didn't have to worry about that? What if it was just in a browser? So Salesforce comes in, they IPO in, I think it was 2004. And the timing here is really interesting. Because when I was doing these implementations, right, this is in the 90s, and we had the same conversation with literally every customer, which was, you suck at this. This is probably going to fail. What if we ran this stuff for you? What if we ran it? You can rent this stuff from us. We'll protect it. We'll be responsible. Safeguards, et cetera, et cetera. And every single one of those businesses came back and said, the customer data is the most valuable data we have. It will never leave our firewall over my dead body. Less than six years later, all of those businesses were on Salesforce. Why is that? It's because it's more convenient. It's because an easier, it's an easier option. 
See the same thing in the cloud world. Right? This has been really well documented at this point. I certainly don't need to go through the history here. But many of you probably had the same conversations that we did with the hardware manufacturers. You know, the Dells, HP, IBM, all the x86 guys would come to us and say, hey, my gear is awesome. Its power, you know, is, its power consumption is low. The performance is excellent. It's resilient. You know, we've built in you know, sort of all sorts of uh, self-healing, self-notification features. We'll know that the stuff's broken before the customer will proactively show up, all these fancy features, right? And it was certainly true, particularly in the early days of Amazon, that the experience you were gonna have on a physical machine was a lot better than the experience you were gonna have from Amazon, a lot better. In other words, when EC2 launched, it took me a couple hours to get DNS wired to an instance. It was a huge pain in the ass. And yet, we know how this played out, right? Amazon Web Services and, and uh, followers into that infrastructure as a service market destroyed the harbor market destroyed it. It basically hollowed out to the point where most of these businesses have either been deprecated or they're a fraction of their former size. Why? Well, it's pretty simple. If the best that Dell or anybody could do back in the day was drop ship, and depending on where you are in the country, we have a fancy logistics system, uh, we'll get it to you in a day or two, and then allow for a couple days to rack stack in on a network, uh, configure the machine, et cetera, or I can have something up in about 90 seconds. That's tough. And again, as we've seen over and over and over again, at the time, certainly I'm not going to make the argument now, at the time, this is a worse product. You are going to have provably a worse experience. It's less performant, less reliable. And yet, it destroyed the alternatives. It destroyed superior alternatives. So what we talk about when we talk to software companies in particular today, but this is true of a lot of different businesses, so this is just one example, is there's a spectrum. Right? There's a spectrum of convenience. So in other words, in the early days, we had the Oracle database. Oracle database was, still is, very highly regarded. It's a very uh, highly refined, battle-tested product. As far as relational databases go, it's a fantastic product. And yet, MySQL, which is provably inferior from a feature standpoint, arguably from performance and a number of other characteristics, is easily the, the most popular relational database in the world. Why? Again, it's not super complicated. We went through this already. It's more convenient, right? I can get one through a single command on a, on a terminal. You know, with the other, I have to have really unpleasant conversations with some licensing people. <laughs> not too difficult to understand. But, and this is one of the things that a lot of open source communities have not understood yet, or at least not fully digested and baked into exactly what they're doing, what is more convenient? than installing a database or any other project via a single command on a command line. How about not installing it at all? Pulling it up as a service, letting somebody else worry about it. So this is the thing. When we have these conversations, you know, when I talk to, for example, database people today, they want to talk to me about their product, they want to talk to me about the, their performance, the features, the reliability, all these things that make it a special, unique snowflake. What they don't talk to me about, typically, is is it or is it not as convenient and easy to get as something that is a cloud alternative? And here, it actually gets worse, because that's a single example, all right? I gave a talk this year, uh, this past spring, the Apache Software uh, Foundation Summit. And this is not to pick on Apache, this is true of virtually any open source community uh, we could talk to today. So we have this, this is just a sort of random selection of, of uh, well, frankly, the Apache logos I had on my computer already. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a perfect indication of the strength of the Apache ecosystem, right? These software assets, if you go back 10, certainly 20 years ago, I mean, these software assets are, are worth billions and billions of dollars. Today, they're available for free as open source projects. You know, you can go out and do immensely powerful things. Businesses all over the world have done this, do this every day. The, so the Apache ecosystem is enormously powerful, enormously influential, but when I go out and talk to Apache projects, when I go out and talk to other open source projects, what we don't talk about typically, unless we bring it up, is the convenience factor. Because think about it, right? If I want Hadoop, if I want the HTTP server, the Lucene, Solar, take, take your pick. If I want any one of these, great, I can go download it. 
But first, I probably have to understand what it is. I may want to do some comparisons between alternatives to make sure I'm making the right choice. And then what if I want to pull these things down and actually have them work together? Who does that work? What if I want to pull one of these things down? I like it enough that, OK, I'm going to roll it out into production. I want to call somebody when it breaks. OK, who does commercial support? How do I evaluate them? Right? And you know, when I take all these different assets that are under the same sort of big tent of Apache in this case, and like I said, this is not to single out Apache. This is true of everybody. How do I make it all work together? All right? That's option A. What's option B? What if this is all in one place? All run by the same vendor. I don't have to download anything. I don't have to make selections. I don't have to choose necessarily if I don't want to. So this is the thing. When we talk to companies, when we talk to open source projects, when we talk to developers, they need to take a step back. Because all of this, to me, you know, having had this conversation in some form or another literally thousands of times over the past decade, is that you really need to think about convenience. So again, when we have briefings, I mean, many of you in the room have briefed us. You come and talk to me about your product. You come and talk to me about your project. You come and talk to me about what you built. We love that. As I said, we geek out, out, out on that as much as the next person. But you need to think about, when you're building a product, when you're building a company, is it convenient? And more importantly, is it as convenient as the alternative? If it's not, you might want to rethink that. Because somebody, somewhere, is probably also selling the equivalent. Somebody is essentially the equivalent of, hey, I have these blocks of ice that I'll sell you. But you know what? I'm also going to sell you milk and bread and eggs. And you know what? And I'm also going to sell gas. And you know what? I'm also going to be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So as I said, if there's one thing that I would leave you with, it's make explicit, dedicate time to yourself, to your teams, to your projects, to think about something that is really doesn't seem like a priority and is almost never on the planning calls or on the product briefings that we make. It's just that. Is, is this product convenient or not? And with that, I'm done. Thank you.